All right, hi everyone. I'd like to welcome Richard. He has a beautiful, beautiful saying about hacking, and it states that it is a practice that must be understood with humility, explored with persistence, and mastered with grace and a flair for style. And I think that that lays the basis for the topic he's going to talk about. He will suggest his insights based on his experience he had during his, during his years. All right, Richard, it's all good to go. Okay, good to go. Good morning. Uh, uh, I mean, good noon. Can, can you uh, hear me all right? Please signify by raising a hand if you can hear me. All right, very good. Wonders of modern technology. Uh, it's uh, early in the morning here, and uh, a cup, cup of coffee and a few pills, and you're good to go. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to come to you this way. I'm sorry that I had to have a tooth extracted, and they ordered me not to fly, uh, so I have to come to you this, this, uh, in this fashion. Uh, I'm going to be talking about hacking as practice for life in this century. I call it transplanetary, not, not only... Uh, because that's a nice cachet, uh, but because our life in this century will, uh, as, as you probably suspect, by the end of the century, certainly be uh, transplanetary. Uh, we will not be limited to this planet. We may not be limited, uh, almost certainly will not be limited to this solar system. Uh, and the transformational power that is a, afoot in our lives right now uh, can best be likened to real hacking, uh, real hacking. Uh, came out of the 1960s in, uh, at MIT, and it didn't apply only at, at first to uh, computer technology. It applied to any ingenious or creative or humorous or innovative or exciting way to take something that already existed and transform it into something uh, radically new. Uh, so hacking is a radical state of mind really, an approach to life which looks at what's been built and has been built to a purpose but sees other possibilities and ends or purposes in that thing. Uh, hacking the universe itself is a practice that must be understood with humility uh, and explored with persistence and mastered with grace and a flair for style. Uh, where does it begin? Uh, it, it begins uh, with the concept from Zen Buddhism of beginner's eyes, which look at what is before us with no preconceptions in order simply to see clearly what is there and to look in such a way that we can distinguish between what's in our own minds, what we bring to the encounter, uh, to our apparatus of perception itself, and what's, quote, out there, that boundary where those meet where we both half create, half perceive the reality in which we live. That's the gray area where hacking takes place. You could liken it to the brackish tidewaters where life begins. Uh, it, it's where new things uh, stir to life. And if you look at the innovation that is taking place today, uh, the simple fact is no one can master what is happening today, even in their own domain. I talk to, uh, when I can, some of the very best uh, people in the world in security and uh, in the intelligence community and what they know is that they can't know everything no matter how much they do uh, because the platform of technological innovation already has been built which enables all other disciplines uh, to move at the same speed with which IT and hacking has begun to move so in a way the future uh, the 21st century is already there. Uh, it's a mold or a footprint of possibility into which the future oozes like rain or mud into a footprint. Uh, and those who allow themselves to connect to the future that already exists, uh, the future that's already there, uh, they may look like geniuses, but they're really just hackers. Uh, looking at the way the present and the future, which are constructions of reality in our own minds, intersect. So it's that Zen concept again, stepping back from what you think is the future and having the courage and willingness to see that the future is on one hand already there and on the other subject to your own creativity. So it does not really exist from one point of view, or if it does, it doesn't exist in the way we think it, it does. It's a possibility, uh, kind of like in quantum physics, uh, when something is a possibility actuated or made real, only when you instantiate it. 
No, studies, serious studies of ESP telepathy uh, have detected hits of future events, what we call precognition, at a rate greater than chance. And that's a, that suggests the future really is already there, but uh, held in suspension and available, and that the one you choose is the one that will manifest itself. Uh, hacking is living on that edge between the present, as we call it, and the future. You know, once in a while I'm introduced as a futurist, and this is a, a joke. I, don't know, uh, I didn't even know if the alarm clock would go off this morning. I don't know the future. Uh, but we try to get our minds around the, fu the present and interrelate the multidisciplinary information that is coming to us and when we integrate that successfully and assimilate it, we can articulate what will sound to people like the future, especially if they live in the past. So uh, the possibilities for hacking in the way that I'm talking about uh, really constitute a reality. And then the other people in the world, the 90% that do not live on this creative edge, uh, live in that reality uh, as if they are in the picture uh, for which hackers build the frame. The frame or the ground of being of the picture are the unseen, uh, unnoticed assumptions which build the possibilities for perception, uh, which our technologies create in the moment that people engage with them. Uh, reality, remember, as Philip K. Dick said, a great writer, paranoid schizophrenic, but that was appropriate for our time. Uh, he said that reality is that which, when we no longer believe in it, uses to go away. So that zone of hacking that echoes the past but anticipates the future lies on the edges of the social constructions of reality that we share. You can live inside them as if they are real, and then you become sheep. But if you refuse to believe in your beliefs and hold them lightly like an agnostic, uh, you can remain open to possibility. So the necessity for mastering hacking in the way I'm describing it, it's not trivial. Uh, it is mandated by the untimely stories that hackers must invent by making and doing and creating, which are contrary to the constructed realities of our times. In other words, if you're living on this intersection of, pa of future and, and uh, present, you are living where the consensus realities in which people believe uncritically are being manipulated and managed. And they are untimely because to create new narratives, to create new possibilities, something as simple as uh, Facebook uh, or uh, Oculus Rift, a uh, virtual reality that is coming. Uh, I, I have a son who works at Oculus Rift, and when he gives me a demonstration of what's coming, um, I think Zuckerberg is right. Uh, this is going to be as big as Facebook, and we are going to live in a shared virtual space. Uh, once the apparatus becomes easily assimilated or wearable uh, and see each other as avatars that are as real as what I am seeing on the screen now. I, I take for granted that what I am looking at, um, that the, the bodies, the people in this room are real. For all I know, this is a creation uh, by a uh, special effects department in Ghent um, and that I'm looking at small, uh, mostly male mostly Caucasian avatars that have been uh, created for my benefit to convince me that I'm talking to real people. Well, the manifestation of you as images assimilated by me as if you are real is just a foretaste of what is coming in the virtual realities in which we live, which means the hackers who manipulate that space will create the reality in which people actually believe they live. Now, we cannot overemphasize the depth of this transformation. Uh, years ago, a computer scientist named Langdon Winter said, to invent a new technology requires that society also invent the kinds of people, i.e. you, who will use it. All older practices, all relationships, all of our ways of defining our identities will fall by the wayside and new practice, new relationships, and new identities take root. Those of you who have lived like an old person like myself has lived through this transformational period understand this in a visceral way.
those who are born after it has taken place accept it as simply what's so. In case after case, he said, move to computerize, to digitize, means that many pre-existing cultural forms have suddenly gone liquid, like an ice cube in your hand that turns into water, losing their shape as they are retailed for computerized expression. In other words, the primary transformation that we're going through is identity shift. And hackers are an emergent reality as a result of the technologies of information and communication which have been built. So what are the sources of your identity? Um, identity is defined by a boundary, a boundary around an organizational structure or an individual person. Uh, we used to believe uh, in what we call nation states. Uh, you, more than people in America who still feel bounded by the edges of our country, like parentheses around their constructed realities, uh, boundaries define we are, and our boundaries are exactly what have been deconstructed and taken down by technological innovation. So what is, what is your destiny is your identity. Uh, identity is destiny. Uh, that happens to be the uh, title of the third volume of the novel I just finished called Foam. I don't know if you can see that poster behind me. Um, showing a man beholding the universe in a uh, wonderful and awestruck way. Uh, that's the protagonist of Foam. And he came to realize in his human form that identity was destiny. Who you think you are, how you define yourself, uh, is in fact who you are. But the boundaries have been radically changing. Let, let, let me give you an example. You and Europe know this. There used to be uh, what we call Europe. Uh, Europe is not what Europe used to be. Uh, nation states are not what they used to be. Uh, where did nation states come from in the first place? Uh, they were a way of organizing our political and social and economic reality appropriate to the speed of the flow of information into and out of the complex systems in which we lived with which we were fused because we ourselves are complex systems of information and energy that are defined by how we perceive ourselves in relationship to the larger systems or structures that we build. And that identity is exactly what's in flux. Uh, let me give you an example of, of how, that, how that looks. I was doing a speech not too long ago uh, for the FBI. And uh, you know, the FBI was originally formed in the 20th century as a police organization to do police work internally in the United States. Uh, the CIA, on the other hand, stood up in 1947, was initially uh, stood up as an agency to do intelligence outside of the United States. But as the boundaries went down, it was discovered that you could not do the one without doing the other. And when I explained this, the FBI special agent in charge of the uh, city where I was doing the speech, uh, he said, bingo. He said, let me tell you what we encounter. He said, we, we used to be able to go to somebody on the basis of their American identity and invite them to cooperate with us on a patriotic basis. Uh, and and they, they generally would. Uh, he said, increasingly, we are hearing back from people. I would like to do that. But, that but is the case. You see, how they perceive the influences on themselves of the organizations in which they're embedded how they perceive power, how they perceive the structures of power that determine their behavior has changed. So while they would like to act as, quote, Americans, unquote, they can't because the sources of power and influence on their real behavior now come from transnational entities that transcend the former boundaries of what we used to call nation states. Um, CIA was forbidden from within the United States. The CIA now openly operates within the United States, for example, in uh, complicated counter-terror activities uh, with the New York police, because they're more fearful of attacks in New York than almost anywhere else. The FBI, on the other hand, originally put up, as I said, to operate in the United States, now has offices all over the world. 
uh, in other words, of necessity, the structures, the changes that have come, the boundaries going down, have altered the identities. Of uh, one example of this funny book called Jennifer Government by Max Berry, a novelist, uh, he gave uh, surnames to people like government based on who they worked for, not the countries in which they live. So it was Bob Nike and uh, John Microsoft and uh, Nick Google and Jennifer Government because those entities had more to do with how they actually behave. You work for Google. Uh, if you work for Zinc, if you work for whoever, uh, your real behavior is determined by the sources of power and influence inside the organizational structure. And those are, in many cases, replacing the power that nation states used to believe they had. Okay, so <clears throat> excuse me. one of the major implications of this is that we used to consider an individual is changing. Let me pause for a minute. I know this is, for me, 4.30 in the morning and getting this philosophical is not trivial. Uh, but bear with me here. An individual is a construction of reality that emerged after the Renaissance and after the Reformation several hundred years ago. And I want to make the point that what you and I think of as individuals did not exist for that time. Um, Take Shakespeare, for example, in the late 1500s and early 1600s. He only was beginning to speak individuality in our modern sense of being distinctive or special because it hadn't meant that for a long, long time. It meant inseparable. Uh, you can look through all the works in the Elizabethan era uh, contemporaneous with Shakespeare and search in vain for works that touch on anything it looks like our contemporary notions of social development or psychological development, the way an individual moves. The word adolescence was invented. It was a French term for a period of life that literally did not exist before it was defined, and it was defined by the social changes and economic changes that enabled it uh, to become an emergent property of society. When we had to begin to prepare people for adult life, over a long period of apprenticeship, as opposed, again, by, uh, for example, by Shakespeare's Romeo, who was 13 years old, uh, people getting married uh, 12 and 13, because they were ready for, they didn't call it adulthood. They were simply human beings. The point is that the conception of self uh, that is now being hacked in fundamental ways by technology uh, is a new emergent property, and so is intellectual property. We all know what has been happening with uh, literature and music uh, and all of the things that we used to think of having boundaries around them in the same way that I'm defining the individual. They don't any longer. This is why you can get all the music, all the movies, uh, really all the books that you want uh, for a little or no cost. But the notion of intellectual property did not exist until the invention of the printing press created a new reality, which was a text that seemed objective and separate from and external to the individual who created it. The notion of an author, the way we think of it, like the notion of itself, did not exist. So the pre-modern concept itself uh, was totally different. Uh, what, is, what is the point? The point is that Complexity in our lives is a function of the speed of flow of information into and in and around the systems in which we live, and identity is the very weakest link uh, in, in that chain. Uh, Matt Blake, a wonderful technologist, said uh, in security, uh, weakest link in the security chain is the definition of the problem, and the definition of the problem is often not what we think it is. In the same way, uh, identity the weakest link in our conception of what's possible, and our identities are really not what we thought that they were. So one result of this is that powers, power is now exercised very differently. Uh, this is why hackers began in the 60s, 70s, then the 80s in earnest, when young people got their hands on the tools and, and could participate in this in a powerful way. 
Power is exercised differently in a network or web, and our identities become nodes in that network rather than the individuals as defined, as I said. Individuality emerged a few hundred years ago, a new form of identity in which we are more like cells in the body and cannot function other than nodes in a network, in part because no one can know everything that needs to be known, but the collective can know it. The collaboratory can know it. The network can know it. And so functional networks for hackers are those that you build from scratch out of necessity and what you need to know and need to do. Originally, hackers coming online in the 80s would use their university computing systems uh, because they couldn't afford what we could afford to buy or steal now. Um, hackers learn exercise power by participating in a meritocracy. Uh, they learned that power was a function of contributing information. You went to someone online uh, and asked for help, and it was clear you had not done your work, you would be kicked aside. But if you had done everything you could do on your own, staying up late, trying everything, hacking the system as best you could, and then went to the best minds in the meritocracy, you would be welcomed in as a learning partner and a functional partner because you showed you had done the work that was necessary to participate in that meritocracy in a meaningful way. But power and leadership in that meritocracy was no longer dominating and controlling. Dominating and controlling is still very afoot in our world, but participating and contributing is how you learn to function in the network online. It was a fundamental shift in the definition of the individual self. So leadership, uh, I have a friend who uh, is whitewater kayaking, and he said he learned when he looked at the rocks, he always hit the rocks, but when he looked at where the water goes, he always went where the water, water goes. The point is that leadership consists of saying where the water goes. And in the way that I've been talking about it, means seeing new and different emergent properties and then giving them a name. Nietzsche said that's what leader that's what creativity is. It is seeing emergent property prior to anyone else seeing them, even a few minutes or a few hours days and giving them a name and they're considered uh, a creative uh, where do these ideas come from? Well in the world that I'm describing where things are changing Parts of the IT revolution as rapidly, as quickly as they are. Uh, they're, they're coming at the edges, the very edges of our, uh, of our participation in, in the world. The edge is the new center. Because if you think about the consensus reality in which you live, it began its life at one time far on the edges. It was considered ridiculous. Uh, John Galvin, who built Motorola when it was a great company, was once asked uh, where the great breakthrough ideas came from that made those huge leaps forward that most did at that time. And he thought about it and he said, they always began their life as minority opinion. In other words, the herd, the sheep, its sense is reality, believed something else. Someone articulated an untimely narrative, as I called it, that was contrary to what they believed. And at first it sounds laughable sounded ridiculous. Um, and they laughed at it. They couldn't take it seriously because it didn't hook into or connect to the reality in which they lived. But if the persons who brought the idea forward repeated it, then, then the consensus uh, would attack it, would reject it, try to suppress it, would even assassinate the character of the people who continued to say it uh, until they brought it forward so much finally became the core of a new consensus. Uh, so wisdom and insanity are contextual. Uh, in other words, the value and appearance and feel of a new radical idea is based on the context in which it is heard. If people inside the consensus reality already integrate those notions in reality, it will sound like well, truth. But it began its life as and Galvin said something else. There's a corollary to this. That he said, that if someone came 
to the room and they had to dis discuss a new thing, a, a new way of, of doing something. And everyone immediately agreed on how to do it. He was always wrong. Now, think about that. He said if everyone immediately agrees that it's the right way to do something, they were always wrong. That's because if the new idea was contrary, uh, to what they already understood as, quote, reality, unquote, they would always believe and behave according to the paradigm in which they had been socialized. And that was always wrong in relationship to the new realities, which was an emergent property of the technological changes that were taking place. So uh, the important thing here is that context is shifting constantly and frequently as a result of domains of expertise that are constantly mined and chained. And that's why, according to George Bernard Shaw, all great truth begins as blasphemy. All great truth begins as blasphemy. And a hacker builds in an openness to heresy, to heresy in their lives in relationship to what people around them believe and will find ludicrous when you first suggested. So sometimes when I'm giving talks like this, uh, people say, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to know that. Because the mere fact of only to question their consensus reality is enough to cause cognitive dissonance and anxiety to a degree that they cannot tolerate. What you do then is boomerang back to clinging to that consensus reality with greater tenacity see instances of this around you. But like the refugees flooding into Europe now, the new emergent properties will not go away. Reality is that which will not go away just because we do not want to believe. Uh, not long ago, I was asked to do a talk for Modern Art Museum in Uj, Poland, uh, and it was called Untimely Stories. Oh, it was for curators and artists were rethinking what Europe meant. Uh, Europe had been changing, as you know. I was a young man, and I lived in Spain, and I lived in England for a while in the 20s. Uh, you always showed a passport at the border, uh, and national boundaries seemed real and fixed, as opposed now to be dots on a map and something uh, transparent. Uh, it was a very different world. Uh, Europe is very different world. The planet Earth is a different world. Uh, so what these artists and, artists and and museum people wanted was a new open way of seeing, defining and seeing the present and future of Europe because the social contract and the ideas on which the definition and concept of European life was based were eroded. And they had to invent and discover at the same time, a new emergent way to describe what Europe is and Europe was, uh, this is hacking. It's hacking. And in Alice in Wonderland, uh, the caterpillar asks Alice, who are you? Uh, so the question that confronts you as a hacker is not, where do you want to go today, as Microsoft said, but who do you want to be today? Because the hacking of the bio itself, the biosphere, and what it means to be human, as I said in my talk at DEF CON this, uh, this last summer, uh, is now the new frontier. Biology is technology. And we can see the markers of how biology emerged as the new frame built on the platform of information technology. Uh, some examples of this, you look for markers of this, and Ted Knight, who works at MIT, uh, had a PhD in computer science, who went back and got a PhD in biology. In 2004, MIT chose its president, a woman whose background was in biology for the first time and not an engineer, because biology uh, is technology and is that frontier on the edges of which a genuinely, fundamentally new kind of humanity is being invented. Uh, and when it's available, if you look at the cross of extensions uh, of, of the human brain and how we are all 
monitoring and hacking our own perceptual apparatus, how we are relating ourselves to our machinery in symbiotic and org like ways, means that probably the last generation to be merely born in these countries which will use this technology to design and create the kinds of human beings we want to be. Um, this is where hackers work today. And hacking biology or biohacking is now available in the same way that computer hacking became available in the 80s when Jobs and Wozniak built the Apple II uh, a long time ago. Um, they made available a cheap, easily accessible platform for people uh, to use that enabled them to uh, put the tools of power in their uh, in the hands of anyone who wanted to use it. The same is happening in biology. For $1,000 or $2,000, you can now buy everything you need to do real genetic work, to do genetic engineering, and to participate in the creation of artificial organisms, uh, which we are doing and have been doing for many years. Uh, you always look uh, to the intelligence community and the military community to see what kind of research and development is forecasting the future in which society itself will live uh, in 10 or 20 years. Because it often takes 10 or 20 or even 30 years for those realities to emerge from inside the security worlds where research and development is dark and it's laid out under different assumptions uh, than open research. Uh, and what they have been doing now is for ways to develop pathogens fundamental when I say they I all kinds of entities are looking for pathogens that literally scare the, the people I know who work at these agencies. Uh, bio is their biggest fear. Uh, bio is their biggest fear. And so they have been working to counter those pathogens with our own pathogens. Uh, this is a different world. And it means the technology and the apparatus of hacking is being brought to bear on the very organic Material out of which we are built, and therefore you can ignore biohacking any more than in the 80s or 90s you could ignore what the internet, as we used to call it, was going to do. And what happened to the internet? Uh, it has disappeared. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean it has become so ever present, so constant in everyone's life, we no longer think of it as, quote, going on the internet. Uh, it was only 10 years ago that a young person would say, I'm going on the Internet now. Uh, now, when you take out your uh, smartphone or your cell phone, uh, you don't say, I'm going on the Internet. You define what you are doing by the name of the activity, the appliance. You might say, I'm texting or I'm phoning. Uh, in the same way that the electric lights that I see on in that room uh, don't mean when you come into the room that you say, uh, I'm on the power grid now. You don't see the power grid anymore. And yet, if someone from the 18th century uh, came into the 20th century, the first thing they would see are those lines of power everywhere in the landscape. But we make them disappear into the background of our lives and just assume that we will, quote, turn on the lights. Uh, in my lifetime, I remember my mother saying to me, uh, Shush, please, I'm making a long distance call. Uh, the notion of making a long-distance call is now uh, un unthinkable. Uh, so it has disappeared into the back of our lives in the same way that wearables, implants, and uh, other means of altering our apparatus of perception are going to disappear into our lives the same way that these glasses are seen. I see through them, but I don't see them. I see through them, and I forget that I have them on. Like others, I've sometimes been looking for my glasses while I'm wearing glasses because they have disappeared to my very sense of who I am. I recently, as well at my age, had cataract surgery, which meant 10 minute surgery, the lens of my eye was removed, and a new engineered lens was implanted, and I was good to go. Um, I had that done in both eyes, and now I see very differently and close up, like the screen at which I'm looking. I can see now perfectly with the new eyes that have been engineered to replace the eyes that I had. That is an example or metaphor for what we are doing to our relationship 
to all of the various technologies, not only of information, but of biology. Uh, and that is why a new humanity is emerging in this century. Now, I'm going to get kind of crazy on you. That sounded crazy enough. Um, a transplanetary life in the 21st century. I'm going to show you a book which I participated in creation, in creating. It's called UFOs and Government, a historical inquiry. I'm just going to say very briefly what this book is about. This book is about the response of governments around the world, especially the U.S. government, uh, to UFO phenomena. Beginning in the 1940s, uh, the government did respond because they were dealing with a phenomenon that they knew was real, which according to the testimony of good observers in the air stations and on the ground, they could not understand or explain. This book, which you probably see, is a pretty thick book, 600 pages, and it has nearly 1,000 footnotes. And what makes it stand out, a team of us worked, see the names of the people, and mine is in there somewhere, right the names of the people, eight people who over years on for 50 years in order to get documents from the government that we used to build the historic narrative. This book is now in 65 university libraries. There's one at the University of Basel. Uh, but it's in major universities around the world because the documentation, 1,000 footnotes in it, only primary data from government sources. In other words, the data in the book is proof. We built a narrative showing how from the 1950s to the 1980s, the government chose a course of action uh, using cover and deception operations to debunk and little reports of unidentified flying objects in order to study and research the subject from the inside and at the same time down the threat to societal norms created by new technology that they could not master, control, dominate, or even understand, nor do we entirely understand it to this day. The book is about the government, how it responded. Uh, it is not about the phenomenon of the day. That's the next book. But our point is that once the government does undertake to manage reality in such a fundamental way, it takes hacking. Hackers like ourselves who have been working in this field for, in my case, 35 years, to the very best sources we can reach. Hackers to put together from the pieces that we can get, no matter how partial, uh, a construction of reality that at least gives us a hint of the size and the shape of the new reality. Uh, UFOs have been statistically debunked as a reality that, like Galvin said, when you hear about them, people laugh, and then if people insist on it, you ruin your career. Uh, I've had pilots tell me they were told never to mention it because they would destroy their careers. Uh, when Deke Slate, an astronaut in own state, reported a UFO encounter above Minnesota when he was a test pilot, uh, the response from NASA was, oh, he's just one of our bleary-eyed astronauts. The message was clear. Bleary-eyed astronauts who can see do not fly. Uh, the modus operandi of cover and deception are three things. Creating illusions, uh, creating dis, uh, disinformation, and distracting people by sleight of hand, and ridicule. And the greatest of these is ridicule, which is used so effectively by the authoritative voice. Hackers don't buy it. Hackers insist on constructing the complex realities of what they see with beginner's eyes in front of them, whether it's biology or transplanetary life, or the obvious fact that life exists all over the universe and that we are not the top of the food chain. This is an untimely narrative that progressively has become accepted more and more. Now no, we are not alone in the universe. The nature of our non-aloneness is, is known in a finer way only to a few. So as Nietzsche said, to build this untimely hacker story, to act untimely is to act counter to our time and for on our time, on behalf of the time to come, that future which we are in the process of half perceiving and half creating. And timely means the one contemporary must be challenged to leave his time, to go beyond his present moment, 
way of understanding reality. And in that sense, the works of artists, hackers, the work of technologists, the works of biologists are all untimely because they disclose, disclose new possibilities for what is to come. They mediate, translate, they expose contradictory ideas, they expose our beliefs for what they are. Beliefs are what we hold now as good enough model or paradigm for functioning in the world as we understand it. And as intelligence professionals know, when you engage with people who do not share the fundamental building blocks of your belief, you must construct an alternative reality in order to speak to the way when the hackers or good technologists explain to normal people, normal users, what they are doing. They step down the narrative in order to speak within the knowledge or reality or vocabulary of the people to whom they're speaking. And if they can't do that, the people say it sounds like magic, it sounds serious, or, oh gosh, you guys are such great geeks, I don't know what you're saying. Uh, but if you really want to communicate, you have to step it down, and in the fact of stepping down, you falsify it. You change it into something that is understandable in terms of the prior paradigm of the people that you're speaking, and you know that it doesn't do justice to the realities with which you work. So, designing new realities for artists and for technology is always untimely creates possibilities for ways of living or being. And what happens when you're confronted with this, as I said, they try to cling to what they believed in the past, uh, and they cling to it more and more tightly. And the f they come up with explanations of anomalies that uh, sound good because they make them feel better in terms of what they already believe don't want to see or understand what is coming because it so fundamentally revolutionizes fundamental beliefs of their life. Uh, this is true in, in religions. It's an easy way to see it. Uh, let me, uh, hopefully without offense, define how I came to some of these ideas. Once upon a time, uh, I worked within the establishment church, and I had a perception early on in the 80s the technology was going to transform religions in a fundamental way. It was going to change the organizational structure. It was going to change the, the realities of power and how it was exercised. And it was going to change the very symbols and images that people used to bind themselves to the tribe of their fellow religious practitioners. Uh, it's primitive, it's difficult to unravel, but we don't look at how technologies created religions in the first place. Just very briefly, because I see time is running down, a few faithful few plug into this. Um, the first religions were oral, oral culture. Uh, and when writing emerged, it was a revolutionary change that eliminated oral cultures, it eliminated oral religions. And either the religious beliefs translated into something that could be written, or they disappeared. Now, once writing took place, the founders of religions, name who you want, Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, etc., etc., they were all real flesh and blood humans who were translated into text. They became written entities with which people engaged through the text. And so simultaneously, two things were happening, at least. One was that the human consciousness and identity to which I referred was being transformed, internalizing what writing was doing human consciousness, and at the same time, people came to believe that in which they were eating and internalizing as an objective reality, so that people began to feel as if they related to these religious founders, as if they existed externally in the world instead of in the text. The printing press transformed that reality, which is why you had the Reformation in your part of the world, you had we call Protestant church merge. It was a function of the technology of the word, the printing and electronic communications for 200 years since the telegraph was invented has done the same. Anyone who is willing to become conscious of that simple reality that I, that I illuminated cannot believe in their beliefs in the same naive or primary way that they did before they understood that their beliefs 
were a function of the technologies that defined words in their heads and therefore the boundaries around the identities that they were creating. Uh, this is the fundamental reality. That I, uh, so context is changed. And as the context changes, the content changes. And as I said, new truths emerge from the edge to the center. That is happening faster and faster. Uh, because in a way, the future doesn't even exist in, in the same way that it did. Let me talk about that just briefly. Um, what do we mean by the future? The future really is construction of reality. Uh, that we share, that we find here and now as a possibility for acting meaningfully in the world. It is what we say is on the horizon. The horizon is the horizon of consciousness as it encounters the malleable uh, material of, of the universe and molds it as we want. Once upon a time, 1700s for the last time, one person could master all that was known. They could therefore uh, master their domain of expertise. Today, as I said, as a result of the IT revolution, no individual can master all of the material, all of the knowledge in their own domain of expertise. And this is for a good reason. It's because it is accelerating, the discoveries are accelerating in their own domain faster and faster than anyone can get their minds around. Uh, thousands of documents created every, every uh, year, and no one person can know all that is taking place, even in their domain of expertise. So in a way, we can say, defining being present in their domain of expertise, no one can live even fully in the present in their domain of expertise. And in other people's domains, they're way in the past. So all of us are living to some degree in the past. And many people are living to lots of degrees in the past. You simply define ways current realities relate multidisciplinary way uh, you're defining the present, but you're also defining the future. And so the future is present. It really is. This is not just a, a word trick. Uh, it's present in the interrelationship of what are the emergent knowledges, uh, known things, known facts, realities in domains of expertise that people are creating. Uh, so what is happening uh, not only to identity, but to all of the structures of power. Uh, I used information security as an example of this when I did this not long ago for a new paradigm. Uh, information security, I said, as one task of the intelligence community, always sanctions break foreign laws while prohibiting similar activities on American soil. But simple distinctions of foreign and domestic no longer hope. The convergence of technologies of intrusion, interception, and extreme reach, combined with a sense of urgency about the counter terror imperative, the mandate from our leaders to do everything possible to defeat some enemy that is amorphous, non state defined by behaviors rather than boundaries, borders, or even a clear ideological region. This has created an ominous but invisible set of conditions that undermine all of the previous cornerstones of law and previous religious traditions. I said long ago, current technologies make speaking of interception obsolete. Our current technologies constitute the physical framework, and the information comes to us. We don't have to go get it built in back and forth. Uh, one of my happier moments, this sounds like a digression, but it isn't, it's another book I wrote. It was a collection of short stories it's called Mind Game. And why did I turn to writing fiction instead of just nonfiction? I was working with some people on ethical issues in the, uh, at NSA mostly, the intelligence community, ad hoc, in conversations on how to relate to the new world which was created after 9-11 when new executive orders came from the White House to the agencies and instructed them to do things that previously we had always thought were illegal and unconstitutional. That was a real breakthrough event for senior practitioners of intelligence because it violated what they had internalized as doable and right 
and possible. But it was mandated by the new technologies of interception uh, in order to fight this amorphous entity. I had written a story uh, in which a dying intelligence practitioner made a lot of statements. Uh, this is what we do, he said. And he listed a lot of things that I, uh, I cobbled together from my understanding and conversations uh, that were true. After Snowden, someone made a photograph of that page and tweeted it, connected to links to Snowden, to show that I could say in fiction what Snowden was saying in reality. Now, there's a huge difference. He was saying it with an authoritative voice and documenting it. I was asserting it in a short story. A friend at NSA called, and he laughed, and he said, 95% of your story is true, but you have to know which 95%. And my experience was that people uh, misunderstood which 95% it was. Uh, the reason I can say it in fiction uh, only was that, A, it avoided uh, any prosecution from uh, violating uh, laws, but it also reflected a new kind of hyper-reality in which we have to live, in which the truths of our lives can be articulated only through fictional means, because to articulate them clearly and forthrightly means, as it did for Snowden, uh, that you have to live in Russia in an unhappy small apartment uh, in, instead of traveling the world and enjoying your life. What security practitioners are doing, let me conclude with this, what security practitioners are doing is transforming the world by their very work. Uh, and the dire possibility of this societal disintegration and reintegration elevates the moral responsibility of you and the security and intelligence communities to a higher level. You are ultimately responsible for maintaining social and global order at a level of understanding far beyond that formulated the past by any single nation. You are part of a global community in the aggregate of practitioners, and you share an ethos and modalities of operation that normal citizens do not, do not have. And you therefore have created for yourselves an intrinsic calling to really maintain global order in a way that's somehow consistent with ethical norms as we refashion them in light of these new technologies. The real definition of the intelligence community as it is, as it operates, is to prevent chaos from consuming the world. And there is a movement of information through that community, contrary all, often to the norms of what we state publicly we do as nation states, in order to prevent chaos from completely breaking out in the world. The world looks chaotic. There's a kind of orderliness to the an implicate order to the chaos is currently taking place because it is attending the redefinition of boundaries around all of our identi identities from individual to organization all the way up to geopolitical identities, nation states, and even the planetary definition of ourselves that we have assumed as a species would be inviolate and now we know is not. I want to simply conclude by saying this is your calling. This is your vocation. Uh, hacking is the practice of activities which redefine the world for people and take seriously plea the necessity of assisting them in moving out of the models of reality which are obsolete and archaic, even if they are only a century or a week, in order to understand what is real in the world. Because those who have a more granular understanding of what the implications are of what you are creating as practitioners of security and intelligence have a higher moral obligation to assist humanity in making the same passage, which you, by virtue of your hacking mentality, your courage, your willingness to look at new things, your willingness to boldly go where people have not gone before. Uh, other people lack that ability, and our task is to assist them in making that trip with a minimum of dislocation uh, in a world in which dislocation is absolutely uh, essential. All right now, I have, I have lost, uh, I have lost the video coming from you, uh, so I can't see you. But I can only say for those of you who have held in through uh, this presentation, thank you very, very much for inviting me into your space. Questions and answers. Uh, if you have questions and you want to mediate them now, uh, that's 
online, but if you want to simply uh, communicate with me by email, I am neurocowboy at gmail. Go to my website, themeworks.com, uh, our theme at themeworks.com. Entertain any questions, um, any implications that I've said for your work or anything you want to discuss. I'm always available that way. Uh, and that I will bring this to conclusion. And thank you. Thank you very much.